Well, hello, welcome. Hello. And Tomas, nice to meet you. And you are the, the vice president of North America? President of Ravensburg of North America, but doesn't really matter. President, <laughs> yes, and they tried to tell me that and I, I didn't hear. That is awesome. So what do you think of this event? I, this is the highlight of the year. It's totally awesome. <laughs> it's really, really cool. First time I've ever been to like a jigsaw puzzle competition of that scale. Mm -hmm. And I think it's about as perfectly executed as you could execute it. Excellent. That's really the, cool. Uh, the the co-founders, uh, you know, they had been at the Worlds and said so they learned a few things at the Worlds that maybe a few things that didn't go as great. They were able to kind of reverse engineer and make sure none of that happened. Right. And they're putting on an excellent show. And thank you for Robinsberger for donating all of the oh, you're puzzles. Welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> Our pleasure, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Our, our product development team has put, and the artist uh, himself has put a lot of effort into designing these. So, like every single detail gets scrutinized and reworked and reworked and so on and so forth. It's really cool. So Nathaniel did come over and talk with us a little bit. So we got yep. to talk to him about his puzzle and, and yep. how. That was the first one in the competition. Right, right yeah. exactly. That, yep. was, that was great. And he said when he found out that his puzzle was going to be used, he said him and his wife had to come. Yeah. Because <laughs> he's in Virginia, so yep. he's on the other coast. Yep. Yeah. He goes, we had to. Competition. And as the, as the teams got started, like we were actually chatting, like we were standing right out there. And you know, I, I asked him and I said, How long do you think it's going to take the first team to kind of complete the puzzle? He said, I think about an hour. I was way off. I said, Two. Oh, you said two? <laughs> <Yeah>. okay. <laughs> it was 56 minutes. 56 and some, minutes. And yeah. Some odd yeah. Seconds. So yeah. he was pretty right on. Yeah, there. he was right on. Yeah. <laughs> so do you puzzle yourself a lot? I or? do puzzle not a lot. But I do puzzle myself. It's more my wife. I got a pretty demanding, she does too, pretty demanding job. So like there's never enough time to kind of puzzle. But I do. I'm the one that kind of loves to put in the last piece. Yes. <laughs> 100%. I'm with you. <laughs> <All right. laughs> I'm pretty good at doing the last piece. <laughs> You know what the best part is? Like when, when, when my wife puzzles, I usually get the, oh, well, there's something wrong with the puzzle. There's pieces missing. There's never enough. Yeah. Right? It's your, yeah, you're right. You're getting all the pieces in my puzzle. And especially if it's a Ravensburger puzzle, that we puzzle. Of course. Yeah. So you're based in Canada then? No, I'm actually based in New Hampshire. Oh, so, yeah, I am. Yeah. I'm originally from Germany, but. Okay. Uh, I assume and from the accent. But, yes, uh, from the accent, absolutely. Could never lose that. Uh, I have lived here in the U.S. for 24 years now. So I moved actually to uh, when we started up our own business. We used to work through distributors up until then, and then kind of we decided to start our own business. And um, I was in international sales before that happened. So I was kind of the guy at the office that knew everything about the market, and then there was nobody else. So, um, you know, long story short, company said, like, would you be interested in moving over here and help, helping to set this up? And I was like, yeah, why not? Yeah, all right. Well, great. Yeah. So you said it had to do, so New Hampshire. Yeah. So, okay. Um, you've been to and seen smaller competitions, but nothing this big then. Yeah. Mostly local, mostly local competitions that we kind of, you know, do with retailers, like around where the office is located, that type of stuff. Nothing of that magnitude, ever. And I suppose, because I've, I've commented to, to the ladies, and what a great relationship this is then to help get puzzling out to a larger community, and it helps you guys, because it kind of ties, you know, connects you with people that already like puzzling, of course. Right, exactly. I mean, the, the thing is, look, I mean, we have seen, I mean, all puzzle companies during the pandemic saw this just inordinate spike in demand. I mean, a sevenfold increase in demand on a global scale is like really hard to process. One, two, like really hard to kind of handle manufacturing capacity wise. Nobody had to like, which is like everybody else, like at some point in time we ran out of inventory. But in the process, there were millions and millions of consumers that hadn't either puzzled in a while or had never puzzled that type of thing that kind of got into puzzling. So I think it's quite, from a business perspective, it's quite important that we kind of 
keep them at it, right? And keep them excited and kind of, you know, and, and keep reminding them about the benefits that this activity had for them when they were all locked up in their houses, so to speak, right? right. Yeah. yeah. And talking about kind of keeping excitement and things, uh, um, Valerie was talking about trying to get puzzles that weren't out on the market yet that no one had put together for the competition, so no one had an advantage and that you are rolling out puzzles constantly, not a huge, you know, but that, that you're, as you get them developed, you're rolling them out. So there's always some hitting the market every month or week or how uh, often? We, 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 we actually work pretty much in two cycles. So like we have a main cycle, which is kind of we rolling puzzles out at the start of the year. Um, and then we roll an additional set of puzzles out, usually like during the summertime for the fall season fall and Christmas, a lot of that focused on holiday puzzles and seasonal items, that type of thing. That's kind of the cycles that we have. Now for the consumer, that's our own internal cycles kind of as we're selling to retailers. Consumers might see that a little differently because not always are we able to keep inventory on track or like, you know, supply coming in like all at the same time when you're releasing puzzles. So it might very well be that we've sold, you know, that we're releasing 20 new images or something like that. And then out of the 20, 15 are in when we want them to be in the warehouse, and then those are shipping. The rest might be back ordered for a couple of weeks. So to the consumer, this might be looking very different as they go to the local shop purchasing puzzles. They might not see all the new ones right at the same time. Right. 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 Okay. So. Cool. I mean, that's, that's pretty well. Any questions? I actually have a question about the pandemic. Was it the blue board? I heard rumors it was like the blue board was like the the raw material that everyone was having trouble sourcing, is that correct? Well, I'm not the supply chain and manufacturing expert. Like literally what happened in our case was, um, and I can only speak for, for us and what we saw, and I've been in with this company for all my life. So like my first job right out of college was with Ravensburger. Um, I've certainly seen demand spikes in puzzles before. We have never seen something like that on a global scale where it happened because it literally happened around the world in literally every country. And we make all of our puzzles in our own factories. So there's a certain capacity of puzzle throughput, output, whatever you want to call it, that you can channel through those factories. And that's then it. And, and that just exceeded like anything that we would have been able to kind of handle one, I mean, we reacted, we reacted very quickly and kind of ordered new machinery, kind of amping up capacity, but that's not, that's not something that you can order like with your Prime account on Amazon if it shows up at your doorstep <laughs> yeah. next door, right? <laughs> so, so, so that was the challenge, literally. I mean, we saw just here in North America, we saw a seven fold demand and it was the same thing. Like that happened like very early on in, I think like April of 2020. And it just kept going, like it just wouldn't let up. So, I mean, it was, I think we shipped about two and a half times the amount of puzzles that we had shipped the previous year. It was still a stunning success, but we could have shipped five to seven fold the amount of puzzles that we did the previous year. We if just, you would have had them. Yeah, if you would have had them. It wasn't so much material. The material shortage just started later in the whole, call it pandemic progression. There were supply chain challenges that, you know, as goods were running out everywhere, papers to a degree still short, you know, there's still industries that are struggling, like certain things are coming in stock and then out of stock again, that type of thing. And then the container delays and all that type of stuff that we hear about and read about in the news all the time, that happened in 2021. So, you know, it was just challenge after challenge after <laughs> challenge, right? The machines, the machine throughput, um, then materials and then like shipping and then, yeah. And it's still every, it's probably still all ongoing to some extent today. To some extent today, I mean, capacity shortages are no longer there. So like you're able to handle capacity. Now keep in mind, all of that was topped off, if you want to call it that, with, with a dose of during the pandemic to keep a factory running and to keep a warehouse running and all that type of stuff with social distancing that doesn't exactly help the speed of your throughput either, right? So like, you know, people that have to kind of mask, you know, like with, with all of that, like all the restrictions that you had to put in place to kind of, you know, even allow your employees to kind of work in a safe environment. And we had, I think, no COVID cases in any of our factories during 2020. 
Um, neither did we have any in our warehouse in, in here in the US. We had some scares, but we had no cases. That was quite an undertaking, but it didn't help the speed, clearly not. So. so you had talked about the big jump in demand at the mm -hmm. beginning of COVID. Now that COVID maybe is kind of waning, you know, as yeah. the demand still staying up there. Oh, uh, the demand is still it it it's somewhat elevated, it's somewhat leveled off, and the market's slightly declining. That's not really all that surprising. It's still when you're comparing the numbers with 2019, I think the market's still up like 35, 40 percent compared to then, um, and I would expect it to kind of stay that way. Almost any, at least during my career and my career with that company and looking at the puzzle business, any kind of crisis usually had elevated the puzzle business to another level, to another level, to another level. Now, take that in the context of a comment like when I, first time I had a retail meeting with a buyer of a major retail chain here in the US after I had started working over here, a buyer looked at me and said, Thomas, he said, like, puzzles? Is that still something that people do? And I said, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was selling, right? <laughs> so, so and then he said, but this is just a pile of cardboard, you know, cut up, you know, at that price point, all that type of stuff. He was like, I don't think he looked at me and he said, like, you know, 10 years from now, you won't have a job anymore. So I was like, well, I guess I got my work cut out then, right? <laughs> and ever since I've been trying to prove that guy wrong. That's it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Always use your detractors as motivation. Good job, Tony. Good, good. Yeah, they said I couldn't do it. I'm going to prove to them that I can do it. Good for you. Yeah. So, uh, I, um, so you guys, so we've been talking about puzzles, but a little bit ago, you were, I had talked with some of the ladies, Valerie, Coit, uh, you have other besides the puzzles then so you've uh, you're getting into other types of games oh, and have, things or you maybe you've already been in been, we have been like like ever since we started over here with the Ravensburger business we have been selling board games and jigsaw puzzles that predominantly has been the business and then over the years we made a couple of acquisitions so we also own the Brio brand and the Brio products some people might be familiar with that that's the wooden trains for the most part this is kind of what people know um, we bought a company called Think Fun, which is kind of brain teaser games. We own that business as well. So, you know, we handle a category that we call construction, which is kind of mobile run, a mobile run system, like I would call that 2.0. Um, you know, open-ended building, that type of thing. Really cool product too. So, like, there's a lot of a lot of things that we didn't do back in the day when I started that we're doing these days. Excellent. And I heard you're the number two gaming company in the world then? Behind Hasbro is what a statistic that was mentioned. Yeah, depending on what kind of statistics you're looking at. <laughs> there's, what's that? There's the truth, there's lies, and the, or no, there's, there's lies, there's damn lies, and then there's statistics. This is, the, I think, what the old line is. I say 50% of statistics are made up. So this might be one, too. <laughs> but it sounds, yeah. You know, the, the, the thing that kind of we, we like to regard ourselves in when we look at the board games business as well as the puzzle business is we are not the cheapest company out there and we don't want to be. Like, uh, we pride ourselves in kind of carefully curating the content that goes into the product, whether it's the art and the puzzles or the gameplay of the games that we kind of put to market. That takes a little bit more time, comes with extra effort, costs a little bit more, but it's things that kind of stay in households for a very long period of time. It's not something that you buy and throw out and so on and so forth. So from that perspective, you're probably the number one. Oh, right, right. No, and I understand that. Right. Yeah. Quality and everything. Yep. And I certainly appreciate that. You know, so I'm a personal trainer and I have a business coach and they say, you're either the best or you're the cheapest and you don't want to compete in bargain basement prices. They say you either put together a really great product and you charge accordingly or you just try to get the bottom feeders and go in for the lowest price and then that's what you're competing for is at the bottom. And so, no, I totally agree with that. Everybody's commented on the quality of the Ravensburger puzzles, of course. So that it, that's what they're known for. I love, actually, I think you all are innovating a lot like when you said puzzles have elevated i think they 
I 100% agree, and I think I'll help you prove that guy wrong. <laughs> So walk me through a little bit of your process now. Like, are you are you going after different artists? Are you going after different genres? How are you kind of like expanding puzzles? What we what we have actually it's been something that we that we've been looking at for a long period of time. So when you're looking at how most of the art that is being put on puzzles is being called it purchased, not so much developed. Is like you know there's shows, trade shows, kind of where you can go and art, art, art agencies kind of, you know, pedal their artists, might not be the wrong wording here, but, you know, you, you just buy stuff off the rack, kind of, that, that type of thing. You adjust for color, you might adjust some detail, you put that on a puzzle, you, you pay a licensing or royalty, and you're done. And the challenge with that process is that all our competitors including ourselves, used to do the same thing. Like, you would all go to the same trade shows. Depending on whether you were the first to walk into that booth or the last, you sometimes got the image that you wanted for your puzzle or you didn't. So we set out, like, a, a couple years ago, like, we have a pretty robust analytics team in the meantime. And we started kind of doing deep dives into our Amazon reviews because the online platforms, in particular on Amazon, allows you to kind of really kind of scrape those and kind of figure out so if you have a successful puzzle what is it exactly that consumers or puzzlers like about that puzzle right and they will give you that's the nice part about it they will give you a lot of detail in those reviews and then we said how about we turn this process on its head and we kind of take what we get from those reviews and instead of buying art off the rack we kind of talk to artists about, like, we brief every single detail in, in an image. So if there is something that's particularly working well or resonating with consumers, then let's try and figure out how we can kind of almost reverse engineer that to make that a successful image. And then on top of that, and that's kind of what I would call the secret sauce of a product development team and product managers that kind of work then together with the artists is you have to have a vision about the storytelling in an image. You know. To me, when you're puzzling, this is, I mean, you all know that. It's, it, it, it's this, a lot of people seem to be forgetting it, and it's a cheap way out. Like, if you're not doing it, you're looking, the image is key in this whole process, right? That, that, that there's a lot of detail, a lot of color, and not just that, but that, that there is a story in there. You're looking at this for 56 minutes, as that team did. <laughs> you know, that's doing a thousand piece puzzle. Some people might be, or some teams might be looking at that for a couple of nights. <laughs> And that you have something to talk about, that you have something that's intriguing, that you know, that 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 tells the story all in itself is the innovation that we're trying to put into those images. That's kind of the secret sauce that goes in there. Storytelling has become such a big part of everything, you know, and like advertising now or whatever. Yeah, it's not here's what it is, it's like here's the story behind, here's what it'll do. Um, What's the one, you know, I was even talking about like the Olympic games, because when I we were preparing for here and having the meeting, it's like at the Olympics, it used to be, oh, so-and-so won first place. Now they go into building the background story. It's like, this person overcame whatever, you know, and, to, and now they're here at the Olympics. So it's really kind of building up the person so you're more invested in what it is. So I think if you're putting together a puzzle that tells a story and, you know, it's a visual story. I, I, that's what you're getting. That's what right. you're doing. Exactly. And it becomes like, you know, it's key even in kind of, you know, non-licensed images. So like, you know, art like the one that we are just looking at right here. When you're then talking about, you know, content providers like Disney. I mean, content providers, not exactly the right name for that. But, you know, almost all of those movie studios kind of will have assets for art for their movies and all that type of stuff and what a lot of companies out there are doing we kind of use that term asset slapping you know they take like things from a style guide and they kind of you know there's certain elements of like a call it a, a cars movie or something like and they just kind of throw them together photoshop them into an image and then that's kind of what you're sending out um, but those kind of movie studios are about telling a story the movie is about telling a story right and if you're able to get that story into an image in kind of carefully curating an image with an artist, yet using assets from those movie studios, you're kind of about to discover the holy grail of puzzling. Right? Well, along the lines of storytelling, have you ever thought about doing an episodic puzzle? Like, 
almost multiple frames, almost like a flip book almost. Yeah. Yeah, we have like it's the it's that type of concept like where you know instead of a puzzle with closed edges, uh, you know, building something that you can add on to, you know, over time, you know, and it's kind of almost it's whatever. Like this could take a couple different things, like living edge type of puzzle, exactly. Um, we have so far not been able to kind of figure this out in its detail. It's something that we've been mulling over for quite a while, but then there's always something else that kind of gets in the way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, but escape, escape puzzles would be another thing of like storytelling, right? Like that type of concept, you know, where there's more to the puzzle than just the puzzling experience itself. It's still the key experience. You're putting a puzzle together. That's kind of what you're doing. But then there's riddles to solve, all that type of stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Great questions. You're, you know, you, you being a, you know, in the business, it's like you come up with some great angles for questions. You bet. Huge admirer. Yeah. <laughs> great. Great. Um, let's see. There was something I thought of when, when that I thought when you were talking, and now I'm uh, not coming back to it right off the bat. But uh, I'll do a quick reset. We're three hours, forty-nine minutes plus into our five and a half hour competition for the four man teams. First did a 1000 piece Robinsberger puzzle and then another 1000 piece. Actually, this was the second one. That was the first one there. And now at least the leaders that finished the first two are working on a 1500 piece. Oh my, this team here, yeah, is uh, getting, getting pretty far on the third puzzle here. And in the room is just amazing. I mean, it truly is. It's wild. And what amazes me the most is like, you know, I mean, it's fairly easy to kind of do this when you're caffeinated in the morning, right? Like when we got, when, when, when the teams got going, but they're like, you know, three and a half hours in and they're still going. Like you can, you, it's really, really impressive. And, yes. and, and the folks maybe listening to the live stream aren't hearing like, much cheering and stuff like that, but everybody's very intent. You know, it's like... Well, puzzling is not a noisy business. Right, exactly, exactly. They're, they're focusing and everything. It's not race car driving. Right. Exactly. It's not F1. Yeah. Or NASCAR, or the yeah. Or the engine. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, folks are uh, definitely very, you know, hunched over their boards. Some are standing, you know, others are, are sitting. A lot of poor posture. I'm leading a uh, stretch and strengthen session tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. Yeah. since I'm a personal trainer. So it's like be a lot of sore backs and shoulders from yes. over. Yeah. But uh, but that's just part part of the business here. They'll recover as long as they take care of their posture when they're not yeah. puzzling. You know? But that's uh, that's how that goes. But that's they, they told me, they go, well, you're a trainer. And I think our folks are going to need, especially after the marathon on Saturday, they're going to need a little stretch. Uh, uh, stretch, stretch, stretch and strengthen session on Sunday morning before round two. So, uh, had you been in San Diego before, Tomas? I have, yeah, I have been to San Diego. I've mostly traveled through. I used to, I used to come to LA a lot for the LA gift show. So, like you know, we're selling during regional trade shows uh, quite a bit. Uh, that show. Uh, is no longer, uh, but that for the longest time was something that, you know, I'm based out of the East Coast, it's cold in the winter and those gift shows happen twice a year. And I was the one in the company, like, you know, as we kind of decided who was going to do what gift show. Like Southern California, kind of somehow I think like I didn't really understand. Nobody wanted to kind of travel to. So like that, I, I kind of gave the team the options. And they all picked other ones that were kind of closer to home. And I was like, you were sure you don't want to go to Southern California in January? And they're like, no, no, no. And I've always loved that trip. <laughs> so I've, I've been out here. I've been out here quite a bit. I love Southern California. It's beautiful out here. Excellent. I've, I've been here. I moved from the Midwest as soon as I graduated from college. It's been 37 years, mostly in Los Angeles, but this is the third time I've lived in San Diego. So it's been back and forth for, for jobs, previous jobs and things like that. So yeah, it's only been here. It's like nowhere else. I'm not moving even to Northern California, you know. I would have considered it at one point, but not before. Now it's San Diego and that's it. <laughs> so... Uh, yeah, so it's been uh, 
it's been a great experience here. I only knew puzzling my family growing up on a farm in Iowa in the winter. It would be 500 piece puzzles and sometimes a yeah. thousand piece. And like you said, the kitchen table would be, you know, for a couple of days, we'd be eating. I don't remember even what we did. You know, we put plates on top of the, or we sat around a different table or at the counter or whatever. But uh, that was a big, a big thing back in the 60s and 70s. You know, we didn't have video games. We entertained ourselves the old-fashioned way, you know. Just, so you guys started in 1884, I think is what I said. Well, 1883 is when the company was founded. Uh, we didn't produce puzzles then. Uh, the family that founded the company and still owns it and, and runs it um, started operating out of a local bookstore. Uh, so they got into, like, they developed their first board game. So the company's kind of or origins are actually in board games. Jigsaw puzzles came fairly late in the process. Like I think, like on a, on a commercial scale, the first jigsaw puzzles that we made kind of started in 1964. There was off jigsaw puzzles off and on, but the true, you know, commercial nature of the business kind of really started ramping up like ever since 1964. Incidentally, I'm born in 63, so like just a year after I was born. <laughs> you ushered in a new era of jigsaw puzzles. I would only hope so. Yeah. So. So was that really when, like, the early 60s when jigsaw puzzling just became big everywhere, or is that when Ravensburger, Ravensburger got involved? That's in when it? Ravensburger got involved in it. Like, uh, what happened, and I, this is kind of company, call it company history and or kind of hearsay. Uh, I mean, jigsaw puzzles have been around for a very long time. You know, it started with, I mean, the word jigsaw in itself, right, with wooden puzzles. Uh, back in the day, like I think a century or, or, or longer ago. And then I believe Hasbro was the first company to kind of produce jigsaw puzzles like in cardboard, the way we kind of currently know them to this day and age. And Ravensburger back in the 50s, while it was somewhat of a global business, certainly not as globalized or as global as it is today, um, they had a team traveling to the US to kind of just see what was going on in the toy market over here, you know, what trends, all that type of stuff, like things that we do to this day, right? All companies do. And they kind of saw jigsaw puzzles and they were like, hmm, you know, it's just cardboard. We make board games, you know, we, we, we publish books. You know, this is, is something that we should be able to kind of produce in our factories that got them started, basically. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, that's fun. In the meantime, Hasbro doesn't make jigsaw puzzles anymore, <laughs> which is the interesting part, right? So, you flop, maybe you drove yeah. them out of the market? No, I don't think that we drove them out of the market. I mean, puzzles is, like we were just talking about that, I mean, puzzles as a product is a fairly commoditized category. You know, when you, when, when you kind of look out, like a lot of other kind of fast-moving consumer goods categories are too, you know, there is a lot of companies, and it's not that the barriers of entry into this business are rather low. I mean, it's not like, you know, there's lots of factories in China, some of them in the US, most of them in China these days, that kind of can make your jigsaw puzzles fairly cheap. So, you know, this has become a very price aggressive business. I mean, you can go out there if you like wanted to and you don't care about your experience with a puzzle, you can buy a jigsaw puzzle, a thousand piece puzzle for 499. You can also get one for $24.99 or $29.99. As you can buy a Dyson vacuum or some other vacuum, right? For example, that type of thing. In puzzles in particular, like there is a, a very big pool of like just very cheap puzzles, which are a quick fix, you know, and not everybody can afford a more expensive product. But um, that nature of the business, I think, and in particular, as far as mass retail in this country, and not just in this country is concerned, for some really large toy companies has made that type of business just not efficient enough anymore and not profitable enough anymore. So, you know, at some point in time, I think as a company, you have to make a decision about whether you want to be in the fast and cheap and low margin or whether you kind of dive all the way in, you build a brand, you kind of develop it from the ground up. Yeah, yeah. And with a premium experience. Yeah, exactly. That's kind of the idea, yeah. There's actually an interesting startup, a smaller puzzle company called Lay Puzz. They're yellow with the black, and I think that they're hitting right on. Like they're like in your footsteps, basically, where they're trying to be more premium, and I think they're doing a great job. 
And they're 100% branded. Like everyone knows uh, Ravensburger's in the corner and everything, and it's very recognizable. And like Puzz is newer, but they're very recognizable as well too. So yeah, I, and I think they're doing it right. Arden Fable too. They have the um, the velvety touch. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. So I remember what I was going to ask you. How the cyclical nature of some recreational, you know, things like if you look back, like the hula hoop. I remember the Duncan yo-yos. I mean, man, when I was in like fourth grade or fifth grade, every person had one, you know. And, and frisbees and kind of like that. So do you ever see that kind of that cyclical, of course it's on a spike now, but is, you so. see that? Yeah, very much so. I mean, there's certain play, call it play patterns that just won't go away and there's no need for them to go away. I mean, you know, there's something very, very essential about playing that kids do, you know, and, and, and certain patterns that kind of repeat, are repeating themselves, emotions. So they're, you know, they, they kind of, sometimes it shifts, it goes to something else, it kind of comes back, but there's certain things that kind of will always be around. I bet you, they, they just, there's no way of like being able to, for a company to replace that experience with something else. Right? I mean, even collectibles. I mean, we talk a lot these days in the toy industry about like that trend of, it's fading right now somewhat, like of, of collectible plush. Um, you know, I mean, I remember when I was a kid, you know, we would collect pins and we would collect this and then there's trading cards and there's all kinds of things, right? The collecting aspect and the collecting nature of things is yet another one, right? Like, you know, sometimes it's harder and sometimes the company figures out something really cool that makes that slightly different, but it's still the same basic concept. Right, right. And, you know, that's kind of just how that goes. <laughs> okay. Excellent. I think Valerie's going to have to come in with an update, but... Tomas, it was awesome. Thank I you. didn't get your last name. Kepler. Kepler. Yeah. Okay. You're the president of Ravensburger Correct. North America. Yep. You Correct. flew in from New Hampshire for the weekend. Yes, I did. We are very <laughs> glad to have you here. And it was a and wonderful glad to, to talk here. to you. Thank you. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you so much. Puzzles are gorgeous. They, yeah. Y'all are awesome. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. All right. Okay. Enjoy the rest of the weekend. Yep. Thank you. I will. All right.